Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to our webinar on the introduction of optional personal unit cost. I'm Reinhard Schulte, the head of the Common Legal Support Service for Horizon Europe. Today we are going to present to you a new simplified tool to calculate and reimburse personal costs. Um, this is the result of uh, intensive work over the last uh, month of Commission colleagues uh, and of colleagues in the Research Executive uh, Agency. Now, we are very, very proud uh, that on the 1st of May, this simplification tool will become available uh, to you. Why am I so thrilled, uh, so excited uh, about uh, this event? Those of you who are familiar with our framework program will have noticed that over time, the last framework programs, the personal cost issue has become a matter for specialists, highly trained lawyers and financial experts to get it right to calculate their personal costs. Why is this so? Well, first of all, the personnel costs are the biggest part of our cost items in research projects. Secondly, personnel costs are subject to a number of different uh, rules. National rules, uh, the rules of companies, of institutions, of um, developments uh, in the legislative uh, area, which only allows it uh, a small crowd of highly specialized lawyers and financial experts to get it right and to calculate the, uh, the personal cost correctly for the participation in research framework programs. Now, um, I want to say that also on our side, we have invested quite a lot uh, to deal with this complex issue of actual direct cost. We have provided guidance, we have provided uh, seminars, and uh, on your side, uh, you have invested in highly paid uh, lawyers and financial experts uh, to follow these uh, rules. So we have on the one hand side the complex rules and on the other side, we are trying that all the actual costs which are generated are somehow reflected uh, in our own rules and uh, to keep uh, a fair result. Now, we have come now to uh, such a situation where we have provided so many guidance on actual personal cost that we said it is time to think about an alternative. And this alternative, to get it right, had to be both attractive, so that many, many, many beneficiaries can use it, and it had to be fair so that the companies do not lose out or the institutions do not lose out. And on the other side, um, the taxpayers' money is well spent. So we are facing three, or we were facing three challenges uh, to get it right. First of all, we needed a unit cost that reflected the real situation. So what was happening on the ground? Uh, it was clear that this had to be in your interest as beneficiaries, as well as our interest, that our unit cost should be as close as possible to reality. Secondly, the unit cost system had to be easy to understand and implement. Otherwise, nobody would use it. And finally, the unit cost system that we wanted to build had to be a system which offered legal certainty. Legal certainty in an area which until now was really riddled with mystery and complexity, that is not an easy thing to do. Now, in the presentations which will follow from now on in the next couple uh, of minutes, you will see how we have addressed these three challenges. You will not be surprised that I personally think that we really made the cut, that we really replied to all the three challenges. And now I will uh, leave the floor to my experienced colleagues to explain to you in detail how we managed that. So please listen attentively, but also be proactive if you have not understood uh, a certain thing 
ask questions, the opportunity will be given when uh, our experts have given uh, their presentations. Make it interactive, make it interesting, um, so that you understand everything, and then please try our system out, use it um, when it comes available as of the 1st of May this year, so in only two weeks' time. Thank you for your attention, and I hand over to my colleague, Anna Lee. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Reinhard, for your very kind and uh, exciting news indeed. Uh, today, I'm very happy to be presenting to you the legal aspects of the personnel unit costs. My name is Anna Lee. I work at the Common Legal Support Service at DGRTD. And today, I'm with my colleague Isabel. We will be answering all your questions on legal issues. Afterwards, I will also pass the floor to my colleague Isabella, who will then reply to and present the part on process. So without further ado, let's start. Okay, so first of all, let's start with a very uh, basic question. So unit costs, why do we even use them in the first place? So uh, just as Reinhard just mentioned, uh, indeed, we know that reimbursement based on actual cost is complex and prone to errors. We've noticed that. And uh, we, there is also a wide agreement that we have to reduce the final financial error rate in the research and innovation program. Therefore, uh, by also adding the factor that most of the beneficiaries uh, are usually SMEs, newcomers with little or even no previous experience working with actual costs, um, in the end, these beneficiaries will make errors. So on the other hand, unit costs are much easier to use, which will then help you to avoid such financial errors. And here, I think it's important to look at uh, really a lesson learned from Horizon 2020. We looked into the universe of the participants in Horizon 2020. And as you may see in this graph, which is very it's illustrative of what we're talking about, on the right side, you have a very small uh, percentage of beneficiaries, which are large entities who have more than 100 grants. And of course, they have the capacity to have dedicated staff and also procedures to actually deal with the complexity of actual costs. And on the left side of the graphic there, you see that on the other hand, the majority of the beneficiaries in Horizon 2020, most of them, which will probably be your case, you have one or two grants, um, you might be a SME or a newcomer and with little or actually no previous experience at all. So here, um, why are we then, you might be wondering, why are we tackling this uh, cost cat category instead of another one? So it's important to note that uh, for personnel costs, as Heinrich already mentioned, they are the largest single source of financial errors under Horizon 2020. So it's another lesson learned. And at the same time, this is also the biggest chunk of, so two thirds of the budget in the project. Therefore, this is the most efficient way to really handle, uh, the, to tackle the issue of the financial error because we are tackling the biggest source of errors and at the same time, the one that has the highest amounts. So on the other hand, you might now be wondering, Ah, but, you know, I've been watching all these uh, webinars uh, done by the Common Impl Implementation Center, by DGRTD. I feel that I've learned so much. I know exactly the differences to calculate employees, SME owners, consultants. This is all extremely clear to me now. I'm ready for the financial reporting part. I'm ready to tackle this based on uh, actual costs. Sure, but then I might ask you then, are you entirely familiar with the project-based remuneration rules? This can be complex, but also can be applicable to your case, uh, maybe. And also, if you have worked under Horizon 2020, you have known that uh, before it was the, the daily rate was applied based on the last closed financial year. But now you have to do it per reporting period. Uh, so this is also something important to be taken into account. Um, and then you might be consider, okay, I have this employee of the month prize for my best researcher and I want to give a bonus to this person. Will this be eligible? 
Well, yes, if the specific conditions are fulfilled and there are very specific rules for bonuses to be eligible. And finally, some circumstances of life might be more predictable than others. Some of your employees might start working part-time. Uh, some of them might take parental leave, sick leave, special leave. So in the end, as you can see, we have all these layers of complexity. And indeed, we've made a huge effort into simplifying for Horizon Europe, but we still have all these layers of things that you need to take into account when you do uh, the actual cost-based uh, uh, methodology. And here, really, it's not about us not wanting to make things easier for you. It's just that this is a reflection of how the reality in itself is. We're talking about uh, very different countries with very different national legislations, with very different uh, practices, remuneration practices, and there is not really one-size-fits-all solution. So we need to really try to find a way to cater for everything, and that's why this is so complex. But uh, with the personal unit cost, it would be the equivalent of me right now drawing a huge cross on this slide and pretty much forget about almost everything that I just said now. Hopefully this got your attention and uh, I will then explain the personal unit cost. So first of all, it's important to note that this is completely optional, which means that the actual costs are still the default method. And here, this is a decision entirely at the individual beneficiary level. So this means that within the same grant, within the same consortium, you can have very different uh, methods. You can have just one with personal unit costs, the other one with uh, the other, all the other participants with actual costs. Really, it's at the individual beneficiary level. And how does it work then? So for this personal unit cost, you will have a daily rate, which is fixed ex ante for each individual beneficiary. It will be applicable to all your Horizon Europe and also Eurotom grants, uh, because now this is a front runner and it will be applicable first for these two programs for now. And there, and also it will be applicable to all persons working for you. And now uh, it, you might be wondering, okay, I got it. These key features seem interesting. What kind of advantages can there be for me? Well, as I just mentioned, so the daily rate will be fixed ex ante, which means that you won't have any more errors when you calculate the daily rate. And also this will lead to less complex, no more complex calculations. And also you will know from the start how much you get exactly per day worked. And this is a really big advantage, we think, because it offers a lot of certainty. You know exactly how much it will be. And also at the same time, um, you will only have one single daily rate for all your staff, so you don't have to be worried so much about all the uh, different differences between uh, employees, uh, SME owner, uh, natural persons under the right contract, etc. Et so you'll be one single daily rate for all your staff. And then uh, the audits, the financial audits, will then focus on the number of day equivalents worked on the action. Because since your daily rate will be already determined at fixed, this means that in the end, the audits will focus only on checking the number of day equivalents worked. Because then, yes, the daily rate is already predetermined. And also, this is a very big, good, uh, very big advantage, which we think is extremely beneficial. If you give it a try and you realize that in the end it's not so um, beneficial for you or for some reason it didn't deliver the simplification that you were expecting, you, can, you, may, you may go back to actual cost methodology. And here I think it's also good for you to have a good rule of thumb in the sense that uh, so for this and also other rules that I will explain further on for personal unit costs, it's good to keep in mind that um, here, just like the logic when you start playing uh, any sport match or a board game, uh, when you define the rules in the beginning of the game and you start playing by those rules, you finish that game according to the rules that you had once you first start playing. You, even if you realize, okay, the rules are not so appropriate, we want, you want to change, that's fine, but you never change the rules of a game in the middle of it. You finish playing your game and then you start a new game match with new rules and according to something uh, different with new rules, that's fine, but you do not then change the rules in the middle. So here is the same thing. 
you can go back to you can get back to actual costs. But if you have ongoing grants which are using the personal unit cost, you will use the personal unit cost until the end of those grants, and they will be bound by such. And for your future grants, then yes, you will get back to actuals. This might be seem a bit confusing for now, but as I progress during the presentation, you will see that this logic applies throughout, and it's good to have in mind as a rule of thumb because it really explains how we design and we, uh, the whole uh, logic behind this. Um, so then uh, how do we calculate the daily rate? It will be calculated in accordance with your historical data. And here what you have to do is you have to calculate the total staff expenditure for your entire staff in the last close full financial year. And what I mean by staff is uh, not only uh, researchers, not only people working in R&I actions, but also uh, your administrative staff, your logistical staff. So in the end, you have to look into your heading staff costs in your statutory accounts and you see exactly what you put there. And then you put it here in this formula and you have to divide it then by the total number of people who worked full time in the last close full financial year. This is what corresponds to annual work units, as you can see here uh, in the slide. And uh, after you get this division, you have to divide it also by 215 days. And uh, also, if you want a more um, complete definition of what is annual work units, you can find it in the Article 5 to the, of the Annex to the Commission recommendation on SMEs. And uh, also, if you have uh, part-time workers, seasonal workers, this will count as fractions of uh, annual work units. So, as I just said, with this daily rate then will be subject to an ex-ante validation. The, your your uh, legal entity appointed representative must submit an audit certificate that has to prove these two figures that I just mentioned. So your total staff expenditure and also the number of staff working for you in the last close full financial year. And th this will be then uh, has to be subject to this ex-ante validation. Uh, and also it's important to bear in mind that uh, you will have to compare the result of your daily rate to a cap per country that will then, uh, this will, this, the aim of this uh, uh, cap per country is to pre prevent unrepresentative results uh, from the daily rate formula due to very unusual um, organizational structures, remuneration practices, and uh, so it will only be applicable if your daily rate is higher than this cap. So don't worry, most of the cases it will not fall under this because we've designed it in a way that it will only capture very unrepresentative results. And uh, so, for example, I will explain this formula here to how to get to the cap. So you multiply the amount of 9,618 euros by the corresponding country specific correction coefficient, which is the one in, your, uh, in the country where you're established uh, and it's the one applicable for under the doctoral networks, under the Maris Kudos Curie actions. And then you divide this by 18 days. And then you might wonder, okay, where does this 9,618 9, amount comes from? Well, we didn't get it uh, randomly. We did our homework and we looked into the Horizon Europe grant agreements that were signed before June 2023. Uh, of course, act based on actual cost, not counting lump sums. And there we concluded that um, we looked at the estimated budget and we saw that 95% of the person months in these grant agreements, Horizon Europe grant agreements that were signed before June 2023, these person months were below the amount of 9,618. So therefore, uh, and also this amount, if in your country of establishment, your correction coefficient is above 100%, it might even be higher for this case. So in the end, we really want to capture those very, very unrepresentative results from the daily rate. And in any case, it will be capped to this amount that I just explained to you how to get there. Uh, but you, maybe this sounds a bit complex and everything, but I'm sure that my colleague Isabella, once she presents you a very interesting tool that we have designed for this, you will soothe you and you will see how it works better in practice. 
And uh, also it's important to note that um, you have the possibility to request for an update of the daily rate every two years. And this uh, request has to follow the same rules as the initial request, which means when you look at the first bullet point, you have to present uh, your legal entity appointed representative. So your layer has to submit another audit certificate proving these two new figures for your updated daily rate. And um, this will only be for uh, your proposals that are invited to grant preparation after the approval date of the updated unit cost. So once again, rule of thumb, your ongoing grant agreements will not be amended to use this uh, updated uh, daily rate. Once again, you don't change the rules in the middle of the game. So the rule of thumb here also is applicable. And uh, regarding the audit certificate that I just mentioned to you, we have provided a template which is already available for download in the Funding and Tenders portal. You may download it and you have to request for a qualified external auditor to fill it out and to verify that the amounts Indeed, uh, it will be based on your records, that on your personnel costs and the work units for the last close full financial year. And then your layer has to submit this audit certificate through a dedicated participant task in the funding and tenders portal. So if everything goes well and you're on the happy path, um, indeed after being validated, after being approved, your daily rate then um, must be used for all your Horizon Europe and Eurotone proposals that will be submitted after the approval date. We also have this more frontier um, situation where you have proposals which were already submitted before the approval date, but they will, the grant will only be awarded after the approval date of the unit cost. So here it's a bit of a more frontier situation. Here you may use it if such condition is fulfilled. So if it's a case where the grant will only be awarded after the approval date of the unit cost. And then, of course, if you, with the consortium, together with the granting authority, you agree on the adapted budget if such is necessary. And once again, uh, the rule of thumb that I just mentioned before, your grants which were already signed and awarded, they cannot be amended to use a unit cost. So this will, of course, naturally be subject to the actual cost until the very end. So indeed, uh, you may revert back to actual costs once. If you try it out and you think, okay, did not deliver the simplification that I was aiming for, this is perfectly fine. My only word of caution here would be to be uh, a bit more cautious, to be more careful when you decide this. Because if you decide to go back to actual costs, you are not allowed to request the use of the personal unit cost again for the rest of the Horizon Europe program. And uh, why is that? I mean, let's look at, at the logic here. The default option, as I explained, is actual cost. You've made an informed decision to try out and to uh, use this personal unit cost. And then you realize again, oh, okay, actually it's not working out for me. It's not, it's not the, giving me the uh, simplification that I want. So you make another informed decision to go back to actual costs and then you have to use actual costs until the, for the rest of the Horizon Europe program. You cannot say again, oh wait, I changed my mind again and I want to use the personal unit cost. This ping pong back and forth, unfortunately, this is not possible. Once you decide that you want to revert back to actual cost, you can do it once and you have to use it for the rest of the Horizon Europe framework program. Once again, the rule of thumb, this actual cost, if you decide to revert back to actual cost, they will apply to your future grants and your ongoing grants, which are using the personal unit cost, will not be impacted and you will use it until the end. So finally, it's my final slide. And as a lawyer, we always like to end our presentations on a happy note. So I'm talking about the cases that the unit cost may be withdrawn. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. But it's important to um, warn you and to let you know in which cases the unit cost might be withdrawn. It's only for uh, cases where we see there is uh, some sort of abuse. And for one of them is, for example, on the basis of an audit report, if it's found that there's incorrect data, concealed or misrepresented information, then the responsible service 
they may withdraw the unit cost for ongoing future grants and also your closed grants, which are still auditable. And this one may be a bit more uh, difficult to... No, this one, um, I, sorry, this part on the check, review and audit, if it's found that the actual costs are recurrently and significantly lower than the unit cost, it might be a bit more difficult for you to grasp right now what it means, but I can give you also an example. So, for example, if you are, you ha you are an entity which has senior researchers, which of course have a higher salary and this will impact the daily rate that you have set at this insider for you. And then with the course of an audit, the auditors find out that, oh, for a certain project that you're using the personal unit cost, uh, you are allocating a lot of uh, low remuneration stuff such as trainees. Of course, with the utmost respect for the work of the trainees, it's of uh, big uh, value, but at the same time, we also know that typically they're not the most well-paid people within the entity. And if we look and we see that in this project, um, you, the majority of people conducting the work are trainees, whose salaries in terms of actual costs would be much, much lower, significantly lower than of the, the rate that you're getting from the daily rate. And you're doing this on purpose to get a profit out of the unit cost, then of course, uh, the RAO may decide to withdraw the unit cost for future grants. But once again, this is a uh, case where we really know that there's an abuse where you try to profit from the system. And of course, once again, it has to be systematic. We have to see that it's recurrent and significantly lower. So hopefully it will not be your case, especially if you're watching this today, you're already being very careful and you're already paying a lot of attention to the rules. So we hope that it will not be your case. And uh, thank you very much. I will now pass the floor to my colleague Isabella to explain the business process part. Thank you very much. Um, I will uh, now continue, as already uh, Anna introduced, um, the part on the business process. So my name is Isabella Prokopovic and I work in the business process unit in DGRTD. And um, before moving straight into the, uh, the process, which I, I assume will be very interesting for you, we'll want to, we want to share with you the tool that Anna mentioned, is the personal unit cost wizard. Um, it's a tool that we introduced to give you the opportunity to really try out to calculate the daily rate, the personal unit cost daily rate for you without any commitment. So the tool is now available in the funding, funding and tenders portal and um, you will find it in our landing page that we designed for the personal unit cost um, after you go for the Horizon Europe funding program. So the wizard basically allows you to, to see what your uh, daily rate would be for your organization. You will see, uh, you will have to introduce the same um, the, the values that you would have also in case of that you would get into in an audit certificate. And um, then uh, you will see also um, the daily rate that would come up. Um, we also, the way how we designed the tool is that we also included a functionality to, um, to, to the functionality to give us a little bit uh, your feedback about the personal unit cost. So there is an option after you do your, um, your calculation to give us feedback what you think about the unit cost, uh, the personal unit cost. So without further ado, I will move now to the uh, really to the process, how to request it. And here um, it is crucial for us to also for, oh, for you also to understand um, that we have first the expression of interest, um, the formal request that will be performed by the LEAR, so it's the legal um, entity re uh, appointed representative, and the validation of the uh, daily rate that Anna already talked about uh, based on the audit certificate. So the expression of interest, we have two scenarios how this, this can take place. First of all, you'll see on the slide, it's that the LEAR expresses interest in using personal unit cost in the participant register. Uh, in the upcoming slides, we'll go through the, it will sh sh uh, show you a sneak peek how it will look like in the participant register for the LEAR. But it basically, um, the LEAR will be able to do so uh, at any given time um, for the organization to be interested in using personal unit cost. 
The second option, here it, it is a little bit different because this, um, this scenario takes place during an ongoing gap, so an ongoing uh, grant agreement preparation process. And here um, the, the, the user that has to fill out the budget table, so it's the PACO, the um, participant contact, or the F sign, the uh, financial signatory, uh, who will complete the budget table, they have to fill out the personal unit cost field. So there will be a dedicated field. And uh, this will also count uh, as a expression of interest. Um, the consequence in both scenarios is the same, that the uh, Lear will be then um, asked to submit that audit certificate, which will be equal to the uh, formal request. What is important to understand that this participant task, it can only be available during an ongoing gap. So in scenario one, the organization will have to wait until the next successful proposal reaches gap, and then the leader uh, receives the participant task. In the uh, second option, so scenario uh, two, um, it, an ongoing gap is already there. So um, once the PAC or F sign completes the table, the participant task or the leader will receive the participant task. Um, the submission of the audit certificate, this is really the moment where um, the LEAR uh, formally requests, requests the, uh, the use of personal unit cost for the given organization. And afterwards, the validation part, this is done on our side. So it's not any longer on the organization side, but on our side. And I think from this point, I um, covered the, this, um, this process, which I hope also the diagram helps you to, to understand what are the options to request it, how to express the interest. So we'll now move, um, as I mentioned already, to the scenario where the LEAR expresses the interest um, in using personal unit cost in the participant register. You will see this is a kind of uh, what, um, what a LEAR, so uh, what, would, uh, what they would see in the participant register. We have introduced a new tab, which is called the special cost methods um, in the additional organization data, if I am not mistaken. And you will see on the right hand side, the button choose cost method. Through this button, you will uh, come to this screen where you'll find some more information about the uh, personal unit cost, which you uh, may, if you're not following this webinar, you may not have known about. So that's why we also wanted to introduce uh, some more information here. Uh, also, you will find the link to the decision on personal unit costs. Um, on the bottom on the screen, you will see uh, two buttons. On the left hand side, the green one, the gray one. Um, this one uh, will, if the leader chooses this one, this will block um, the personal unit cost for the given organization. However, if, you, if the leader wants to express interest in using personal cost, um, they choose start to use personal unit cost on the right hand side. So this is really the part on the expression of interest. Now we move to the part on the uh, formal request, so the participant task, how this will look like. We have um, the screen where you see upload unit cost for personal uh, certificate. Um, you will be first asked, of course, to submit the certificate that you received from your uh, auditor, but then you will also um, see um, on this in the second button, in the second half of the on the screen, um, the two values that Anna already explained before: the annual work unit and total staff cost. So um, here you have to insert them manually, but of course they have to be in line with what's in your uh, certificate. Also, you will have to um, reply to the question whether um, the uh, certificate is based on records that had been subject to a statutory audit. So if you would like to upload your certificate, it will look like this. You uh, upload it here. Once done, this is then the, the, the screen that you will see. The audit certificate is uploaded. The um, two values, the annual work units, total staff costs are filled out. Um, of course, in line with the certificate and the question has been, um, the last question has been um, responded to. Afterwards, you will choose, uh, you will go forward by clicking calculate and the system will calculate your 
um, your daily rate applicable to your organization, also taking into account uh, a cap, if of course applicable, not necessary, but just to say also to, to, to kind of um, follow up also what Anna explained before. Uh, once you, you have your daily rate displayed, you will be then still asked if you, uh, for final confirmation before moving uh, onwards. Uh, uh, by confirming your choice and choosing personal unit costs for your organization. Um, of the process side, this would be it. This is really the, the key, uh, key information that is important for us for, and for us that you know at this stage. Um, but you will find a lot of more information, first of all, in the decision uh, authorizing the use of personal unit costs. So the, all of these links lead to our funding and tender portal, which is really the, the source of uh, a tremendous amount of information. First of all, the decision. The second, the landing page uh, for personal unit costs that I said you will, ha you will find um, in the, when you choose as a uh, funding program Horizon Europe, and then you will see also uh, another uh, button to the landing page, and the personal unit cost wizard, which is really a tool that can be very helpful for you, Will really a tool that uh, gives you uh, the opportunity to give it a try without any commitment. Um, you can always leave us uh, some feedback, and uh, we'll very much appreciate if you, uh, to, to, to receive it. Okay, so from my side, it will be also it. Um, thank you very much for, your, for, for, for the attention. Also, thank you, Anna, for, for the first part. But of course, uh, our webinar is not only for us to give a presentation, but really hear from you and uh, hear your questions that um, you've seen probably in the beginning. There was a Slido, um, Slido code. Uh, we'll make sure to um, try to either uh, show it right now if not possible um we'll give it a try um but the the slider code um should be uh visible um not yet one moment and but of course if there will be if you have already submitted your questions we will also uh be able to uh to to go uh through them um Good. I think also I could pass on the floor now to my colleague uh, Ulrich Genschul, who is the head of sector uh, for supplication funding, um, to uh, guide us through the uh, Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thanks, Isabella. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm Ulrich Genschul, also from the Business Process Unit. I have the pleasure to guide us through the question and answer session. Uh, I see there's uh, a lot of questions already submitted. You see on the left-hand side of the screen also the QR code and the code to join that Slido session to submit further questions and to upvote existing questions, if you like. So I start with the first question. How does this system cope with yearly increases of people's salaries, uh, for example, to cope with inflation as it uses the spendings from last year? Um, I don't know, uh, does, uh, does any of you want to, Isabel, would you like to reply? Uh, good afternoon, I'm Isabel Leroy, I work in the Common Legal Support Service with Anna, and thank you for this question. So indeed, inflation is something that unfortunately we have experienced in the last years, but here you will see that it's not really different from what we experience in actual cost grants, because in any case, you will have to prepare an estimated budget with, the, with your proposal, and when it's an actual cost, then you fix your budget for personal cost at the moment when you are preparing preparing the proposal, where here you will ask for, uh, make a request for the unit cost for personnel and then the unit cost will indeed be calculated based on your data from the previous year, but that's only one year difference. And then uh, you will apply it in this grant and keeping in mind that after two years, you can make a new request to update your uh, personal cost, your unit uh, cost for personnel. But of course, then it will apply in future grants. But you will st here, the, the conclusion is really that we are in something that is not very different from uh, in, uh, in respect of inflation from what we experience with actual cost grants. And maybe we should add that, uh, as pointed out in the presentation, the personal unit cost 
can be updated every two years. Mm -hmm. So uh, the rate that you'll be using will never be older than two years. Um, uh, I think we can go to the next question. Will there be a step-by-step -step handbook manual? I think I hand that question to Isabella. Thank you. Um, indeed, uh, we are um, in, the, in the process of preparing something like this. I wouldn't even, uh, a step-by-step -step handbook manual, this is not what we, we have in mind, but indeed, uh, we are aware that further guidance will be, uh, will be uh, helpful for, 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 the, for the applicants. So, um, I think there will be something uh, that will be available. Yes, and I invite you to really go and look at the landing page that we mentioned. Uh, we are just starting this, so uh, it's not yet fully populated. It will grow with further guidance. Uh, and also, as we learn by doing, we will provide information as needed. Next question is, do you consider for the future the possibility to update the amount of unit cost annually, not only every two years? Maybe, Anna, would you like to try and reply? Of course, thank you, Ulrich, and thank you for this question. Indeed, uh, for now, as the way we designed it, it's only every two years. And uh, in fact, we, are, we have not thought of this yet. However, um, about the possibility to request it annually, but this is, as we say, it is a front runner. This is kind of a project, a pilot project. So we will, of course, uh, look into how it works in practice, also based on your feedback. And of course, we can always reassess. But for now, the rule, it is that you may request it every two years, the update. Yeah. Thank you. Very clear answer. No, this is uh, because I just saw lump sums coming up in one of the questions. So it's a little bit like with other simplified cost options that we've been introducing. We are a learning organization, so indeed we'll be assessing how it works and uh, what optimizations can still be done. But yeah, we have to uh, start somewhere and uh, this, is, this is the rules for now. This doesn't mean it's set in stone for the rest of the program. Next question. The Horizon Europe project on which my company is working started in January. Can we calculate personal unit costs retroactively from January? Isabel, can you answer that one? Yes, so <clears throat> Anna touched upon it a little bit during the presentation, but indeed uh, the request for personal cost can only be made from the 1st of May 2024. And then when you get the approval of your unit cost, this will apply in the grants, which will, well, future grants, but all, only the grants which are in gap at this, at this stage. So. Uh, Unfortunately, in the case of a grant that has already started in January, it will not be possible to use it. However, if you have another grant coming up, you could indeed have it in a future grant. Thanks. I think this is clear. Next question. Do you think this, I, I understand, the personal unit cost might really solve the issue with the complex rules? How many participants will possibly use it? 5% or less? Any estimates are welcome. Maybe I can try and answer that one. Uh, well, of course, it is super difficult to estimate now. We are starting up now. We will see, and as, I, as we said before, we will, of course, uh, uh, go on learning by doing and make amends if necessary. Uh, certainly, I think it will uh, solve the issue with the complex rules for those that will use it. And so that's an informed choice that uh, Anna called it like that. It's a very good way of uh, naming it. So it's your informed choice whether you want to say goodbye to the complex rules uh, and have a simple way of reimbursing personal costs or stick with the actual costs. And then, of course, you also have to keep the complex rules. So the choice is yours. Uh, there's no way of telling how many people are going to use it, how soon. Uh, the, so transitions like these are, um, well, this is, this is the learning exercise uh, for all of us. We'll see. Next question. Can the option be tested on only one project or when you decide to give it a try, you need to use it for all grants? I think that's a legal question for Anna, maybe. Thank you for this question. And indeed, as I explained before in the presentation, um, so once, unfortunately, you cannot cherry pick here. You cannot just say, oh, for this project, 
I want to do I use a personal unit cost and the rest I keep with actual costs. This doesn't work like this also for matters of certainty, legal certainty above all. So once you, desi you decide and you make the formal request to use the personal unit cost and this is approved and validated and approved, it will be used for all uh, the um, door to all your proposals that will be then, uh, all your grants that will be signed after uh, the approval date of the personnel unit cost. So indeed, uh, if you have one, you have two, that's another question. But uh, unfortunately, you cannot just decide, oh, for this specific project, I want to use the, use the personal unit cost and for the rest, I'll be bound. Uh, you cannot just pick, sort of, you have to choose one method and then of course if the personal unit cost after you choose it it's not uh, the most uh, desirable or somehow you may then revert back to actual cost but you cannot just uh, use both in this way i hope this was clear yeah i think it was clear uh, so no no way to just test it on one project unfortunately it's it's all in uh for personal unit costs or all projects continue with actual personal costs. That's the decision to make. Next question. Do students and interns and in-house consultants count towards total number of staff working? Isabel. Yes, so here really reaching the added value of the unit cost because you really have to uh, now when we're considering the use of the personal unit cost, forget about the other categories, because indeed, and when you are in the actual cost world, you have to really think hard of which staff goes into which category. Well, here you will just take the daily rate that you have in your personal unit cost and apply it to all the persons working on the action with which you have a working relationship. And so here students, I understand you will be um, I'm assuming this is students with ha which have a work-oriented contract because that's what we consider as a work relationship. And in-house consultants, uh, if they are, uh, they would have fall fallen under the what we call the uh, natural persons with the direct contracts uh, with the beneficiary. All these people working for you for the action, you can just apply the uh, personal unit cost. Thanks, Isabel. Uh, let's go to the next question. Just to make 100% sure, so indeed we, we've seen that question before, but to make 100% sure if a grant agreement has been signed in the past and the project has already started, we are not allowed to switch to the new cost, right? Now, I'm not a lawyer, but I think I can answer, yes, this is right. This is, uh, this is, exactly, uh, this is exactly the case. This is how we mean it. Uh, next question. Why not use lump sum instead? Now, I think I can also take this one. Well, uh, lump sums and the new personal unit cost, they are complementary. The thing is that lump sums are not going to cover 100% of the program, certainly not in the foreseeable future. So even if we further increase lump sums, they are, uh, well, uh, only a fraction of the total program, while the personal unit cost you can use effectively everywhere. Uh, everywhere where otherwise actual personal unit costs are used, you can replace them with the personal unit cost in the future. Uh, you can also, this is certainly possible, in a lump sum proposal, a lump sum grant, you will also be able to use your personal unit cost once it's validated. So it's not really one or the other, it is both that we need to reach our goals. Next question. So what qualifies uh, as an audit certificate. Isabel? Yes, so here uh, you really have to use the template that we provide. So that's the basis. Uh, that you will have a link in the guidance to this template and the template is already available on the reference document page for Horizon Europe. And then this uh, template explains uh, has, uh, it needs to be filled by a qualified independent auditor uh, and that's the uh, standards for this uh, qualified independent auditor or in a 2006 uh, directive. It's the same standards as we use for the auditors that you use to do the, certi the certificate on the financial statement, if ever some of you are familiar with this concept. And then uh, you just follow the template, fill it in, and then it, it has the, the value of the audit certificate that we want you to submit with the request for the personal unit cost. 
Thanks. I think that's that's clear. Next question. Um, is it possible? Can we accept a rate higher than the one calculated with the formula by uh, providing an, an explanation? For example, the explanation that uh, you are bound to salary increases of a certain percentage per year. Um, I think uh, I would pass that to Anna. Would you like to answer? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, from what I understand, it's a, it's a suggestion, I guess. Yes, it's a question whether we can do this, yes. whether it's possible. Uh, unfortunately, this is not uh, possible because, uh, as I've mentioned before, in terms of legal certainty, uh, the, uh, one of the big advantages of this personal unit cost is that you will know exactly how much you'll get per day worked from the start because you have this calculator from the daily rate and in principle it will remain the same unless you update it, right? But here you say that it's you to accept a rate that is higher by preventing explanation. This is not entirely clear to me how you will get to this. Okay, you say it's binding to the salary increases, but once again, uh, in the end, it's, it, it's not uh, certain, first of all. It's not as certain as having one daily rate, which will be applicable to your grant throughout it. And at the same time, exactly, this already adds a layer of complexity, which is exactly what we're trying to avoid here by trying to simplify. So for now, my answer, and no, my answer is this is not possible, but whether it would this be feasible, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question that we can look into, but for now, at least, this is definitely not possible. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Yes, so not possible, but indeed we are we are really interested in your suggestions and in your feedback. Also, not only today, but also in the months and years to come, we'll be happy to learn how this works and what can be improved uh, without any, uh, you know, further. Um, well, so that that is sort of something to be decided and looked into in the future. Huh? But so b please tell us what you think and provide your feedback. That's very welcome. Next question. Do all partners in a consortium need to use the same personnel cost method? I think I would like to give that maybe to Isabella. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, no, of course not. So the personal unit cost is a method that is decided or is chosen by one organization in a given consortium. So of course, um, we can have a situation where in one consortium, in one project, we have organizations with using different uh, cost methods for personal costs. So this, I hope, answers the, the, the questions. Yes, the model grant agreement accommodates uh, different cost methods by the different beneficiaries in the same consortium. One can use actual cost and the other one can use personal unit cost in the same grant. Next question. Uh, but even if you update your daily rate every two years, this new rate does not apply to ongoing projects, only to the new ones. Is this right? Uh, to be certain, I give this to Isabel. Yes, so Julia, indeed, you have well understood the explanations given, given by Anna. If you request for an update, after the approval of the update, it will only apply to grants invited to grant preparation after the approval, so new grants after the uh, update. Thanks. Next question. You said that having a lot of trainees could give you problems when their cost is significantly lower. What does significantly lower mean in numbers? Uh, no, I mean, uh, before I pass the floor to Anna, I, I should say uh, there is no problem in having a lot of trainees in any of our grants. This is, this is entirely, uh, this doesn't change to before. Uh, this wasn't a problem under actual cost and it will not be a problem with the personal unit cost. So just to assure you on this and then maybe Anna, can you... Indeed, oh, just sir. to thank you, mm -hmm. just to mm -hmm. clarify, maybe I was not entirely clear. As Ulrich has mentioned, of course, having a lot of trainees will never be a problem. Um, uh, what I meant here is that uh, we can see that your uh, that the beneficiary is exploiting or abusing the use of the unit cost. And what does it mean? So I gave you this concrete example for you to have an idea. But so imagine in a scenario where you have a certain daily rate, right? Imagine that is, 
I'll give you a number, but uh, I don't know, 50, okay, five zero. And then we see that for one of the projects that you have ongoing with personal unit cost, you only allocate staff, which are junior researchers, trainees, whose daily rate in principle, if we look at the actual cost of, of their work, would be, I don't know, 10 or 20, okay, 20 maybe, no, even 10, let's put it that way. I'm giving these numbers completely uh, right now out of our top of my head, but it's just to exemplify that, um, of course, if you can provide a justification, okay, uh, here uh, in this project, we have a lot of trainees, a lot of junior researchers, because it's not very high level, they do this part of the work, etc., etc. this will not be a problem. But if we see, and this is based on a check, review, or audit, that you are doing this, so you're allocating systematically to all the projects you have, which are high level, where you put your proposal in Annex 1, oh, look, uh, I have this high level project where I have um, all of these famous uh, researchers, all of these high level people working on it. And then we look, and in the end, you only have uh, junior researchers, trainees doing the work and you're doing it in order to gain the profit from the use of the personnel unit cost. Because if you had used the actual costs, you would be paying much less, you would have much less reimbursement. So in the end, it's about abusing the system by trying to make a profit out of it. It's not about who you allocate, if you have a lot of trainees, have a lot of junior researchers or not. And uh, really, it's if you do it systematically to gain a profit by comparing then that your actual costs are recurrently and significantly lower than the personal unit cost. Hope this was clearer. Thank you. And maybe I would like to add that for me, the key is the recurrent nature. So if there is one project with uh, many trainees, that is not the issue. Uh, the idea is normally that this, uh, the personal unit cost applies to all of your projects. So it's quite normal that in one project you have maybe another distribution of staff than in another. So they're not all the same. So, but if systematically and recurrently all of your projects really use uh, very low uh, uh, staff at, uh, at low costs, uh, and this is, this is really uh, established as a recurrent pattern, that could really give rise to the withdrawal of, of this unit cost. But I think here we shouldn't uh, try to make anybody shy. This, this, the the uh, expectation is not that this, this is very likely going to be an exceptional case, I think we can say. Uh, that is not something that we would expect happens uh, frequently. Quite the opposite. So I don't think you need to be worried too much on this account. Certainly not if you uh, do due diligence and you provide the right numbers based on your accounting system, I think uh, we should rather stress this is a rather legally certain system that gives you all the certainty possible that afterwards your costs will not be questioned. And that is, the, that is after all the basic idea of this uh, personal unit cost system, to make it simple and to give you a high level of legal certainty that the unit, once established, once validated, uh, is stable and is not going to be questioned. So a lot needs to happen before we will withdraw it or question it. Next question. Uh, hello from Istanbul, hello. Uh, would you share the presentation with participants? I'm sure that will be the case and we will have that presentation on the landing page later on. Next question. Is the audit certificate available? Is the template available? Yes, everybody in the round is nodding. This is available. To my knowledge, is already published, but here I'm not sure if that is the case, if it's already accessible through the landing page. If not, it will be very soon. Okay. It's already on the funding and tenders portal. It's already available to be downloaded. Yeah. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. I hear it's already available, then probably under the reference document section Indeed. of the funding and tenders portal. Next question. Personal costs are calculated with actual costs, and we have a specific staff budget for specific person months. If we change that, we need more person months in order to cover it. Now, I see this as a comment, not more than a question. Uh, uh, 
that is not entirely clear to me. I'm not sure if anybody wants to... Uh, I can give it a try yeah. because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say that we have two situations here. I'm not, I'm not very clear. The question is if you had, were already working in a personal unit cost environment, if you had your personal unit cost authorized, you will build your budget based on this personal unit cost. And so your person month should just correspond on the real effort that you would put in the in uh, action and then use the personal unit cost to calculate the uh, personal cost that would, be, or that would correspond to these efforts. However, if you're now talking in this question about the situation where you, are, you have, for example, uh, made a proposal and it's actually uh, maybe just accepted, not yet into the grant preparation uh, stage, and you think, what, do I, what will happen if I now request from the 1st of May the personal unit cost? And indeed, uh, if the grant is awarded just uh, is af uh, after, after that, you could still make use of the personal unit cost. Well, then we indicated that there is a possibility to use the uh, personal unit cost, but that's if you reach an agreement with the consortium and the granting authority on the uh, reshuffling of the budget that may need to be done uh, from this uh, move from actual cost to the personal unit cost in this very specific situation where you would have your proposal already submitted now and a grant preparation that would be ongoing in the next month from May onwards. Thanks, Isabel. I'm not entirely sure we really covered that comment or question, but we uh, did our best. Uh, our time is actually nearly up. I suggest we can maybe take one or two more questions and wrap up. Uh, next question from Anne. I oh, know it's changed again, so uh, anonymous. Due to this novelty simplification, do you consider removing the possibility of project-based remuneration in FP10? I'm not sure if there's any concrete plans. I'm not sure if you know anything else, anything more. I think it's very early and I don't think no. the things are related. And so yeah. Uh, yeah. FP10 is still something that we are really in, in, in the process of reflecting on. So we, we, there's no answer that at this stage. Yeah. I think we can't really comment on that question. Next question from Anne. Will the cap amount also be updated frequently? If so, with which frequency? I don't think we have established so far the frequency with which we will update it, but uh, no doubt it can be updated. Uh, that is to be discussed. Uh, and. Uh, yeah, I think for the time being, we have this uh, cap amount in the decision. So uh, only if that decision is updated, can we also update the cap amount. I'm not sure if uh, Anna Isabel want to... No, I mean, for the moment, is this in the, the you will can find it, this cap in the decision on the methodology for the unit cost. Mm -hmm. Indeed, there's no uh, provision for the update, but... If need be, I think that's the type of thing that we see after a couple of years. If we see, feel the need to update the decision, it can be considered at that point. Yeah. So for the time being, the cap is fixed. And as we said a couple of times before on your suggestions, of course, uh, we're not excluding updating it in the future. So I think I take the next two questions. The last two questions, they se still seem quite interesting and interest for a broader um, audience. Are costs of the ad hoc audit certificate eligible project costs. Isabel. Yes, so um, normally in most, most cases in uh, the uh, audit, for the certificate from the auditor will be done, be done before the duration of the action. So in any case, the cost, these costs would not be eligible because one of the conditions for the eligibility of costs is that they are incurred during the duration of the action. And in any case, we don't see, uh, we have not foreseen the eligibility of these costs. Also considering that the certification will only uh, concern two amounts. So we are uh, hope that the amount for the, for the audit certificate will be rather low and very reasonable. Thanks. So I think I skipped the, the comment from Alex. Uh, we've answered that one, I think, uh, uh, extensively. Um, so one last question. Uh, how does this work with seconded personnel? I think that might, since seconded personnel is indeed happening quite uh, frequently. Uh, Anna or Isabel, can you take that one? So again, uh, 
if you're using the personal unit cost, you really have to get into this new mindset that you will have one personal unit cost that you will apply to all the cost categories. And that's including if you're talking about seconded personnel, if you're on the actual cost world, that's under the six, Article 62A3 of the uh, Model Grant Agreement. Well, as the other cost categories, this will fall under the uh, personal unit cost and you, can, you will have to just to uh, record the time that this person worked on the action and apply the same daily rate as for all your other staff working on the action. Thanks very much. I think with this we come to the end of the question and answer session. We run a little over schedule already. Um, thanks very much for your attention. We'll keep in touch. Um, uh, I'm sure there will be uh, other occasions to exchange on this and to provide training and information. As we said, you can find information on the landing page and there will certainly sooner or later be further webinars for your additional question as they come up uh, as you start using this system. And uh, before we um, finish, I will pass the floor to my colleague Olivier. Yes, thank you Ulrich. Uh, I just have a little announcement to make because it seems that the uh, interest for this webinar was so big that actually the uh, research and innovation community platform lagged a bit and uh, many people uh, struggled to actually join the webinar and many, many of you joined the webinar uh, when it was actually running. So I just want to underline that the recording of this meeting will be available on the event page. Uh, and on YouTube as well. And so will be the presentation and all the slides. So you can actually watch everything again, uh, even if the meeting is uh, ended. And that's all I wanted to say. And uh, thank you again for your interest in this webinar because we didn't expect such a uh, big traffic. Thank you very much.